Dog Dog medicine. Medicine. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a lot of things related to small farm, kind of in the context of some national numbers, but we want to always keep in mind, I guess, even what's going locally on the ground here. Uh, the, the photo here to the, the left here, that's actually at, at a farmer's market. And over here to the right, this is some production up on, on the Navajo and some products that are here. You can see some value added products here and the corn down here and everything. But just if anybody's uh, listening, they're able to respond here. What do you think is the most valuable crop in this corn crop here that's grown right in, in these mountains here out of Tuba City in the valley there. What's, what's the most profitable commodity? And it's not the, the corn ear. So. The starling? Uh, no, it's, it's actually the pollen from the corn. Oh, the pollen. The, the, the pollen is used for ceremonial things and, and it, it's, it's unique in the sense that it can't be substituted. It has to be kind of grown in this area here with, you know, kind of facing the mountains so that you just can't take any pollen from anywhere and, and substitute it with that. So today I want to go over some numbers here from NAS and uh, Economic Research Service and also some things with what's called the ARMS, the Agriculture Resource Management Survey. Let's look some things at the farm characteristics here with their sales, income, balance sheet, and land use. I'm going to talk about some direct farm marketing in relation to the Ag Census, as well as tie into some things here with our website we've been working on here called localfresh.info. And Matt is going to uh, provide some uh, insights there too as well, and some things we're working on to try and connect uh, pro producers that are marketing local with, with consumers there. Now, just to give a a little background here on U.S. farms and their economic contributions. Uh, USDA, there's going to be some different definitions I'm going to show you here this afternoon, but for this purposes here, it's broken into four categories. And we have a very low sales here. They make up 48.3% of the farms here in the, in the U.S. And the small commercial, they make up 42.1%. They have uh, what's referred to as a gross cash farm income. It's kind of market sales, but it adjusts for other things with regards to government payments and, and a few other things. So uh, a gross, gross cash farm income is typically the number that, that is used here. And then uh, you see as we go into the bigger farms and midsize, they're only 6.1% uh, of all farms, but they account for here like 20.9% of the value of all ag production here. And they operate on uh, 23.7 million acres. The very large are, you know, 3.5% of all farms and they account for, you know, 56.7% and they operate on 29 million acres. So a couple of things that jump out here on this graph, I guess, to me, well, of course, just we were going over, you know, that, you know, 90% of all farms are, you know, fairly small here. And also just by, just to keep in mind, what is a farm? A farm is an entity that has uh, sales of $1,000 of agricultural products or the potential to produce $1,000 in, in ag sales. So it's not a high bar. In, in terms of farms. So that's why we probably have 90% down here and over half down in here. But the other thing that jumps out at me in this graph also has to do with what do you see about the total production and the total acres operated? Does anybody see anything there? Yeah, the oh. small commercials operate more than the big, big guys right. produce but, but, about half. But, but look at the percentage here of the acres are oper operated for the midsize right. versus their total production in terms of value of production. 
-hmm. So like in the US, we had, you know, 394 billion here in 2014. And when you go to the very large, what do you see? They're, they're producing a lot more per acre of land that they have than like the midsize, correct? Mm -hmm. Look at that, they're doing, you know, 56% of that 394 billion, you know, so they're doing over 200 billion on 29 million acres. And as you move down here, what do you see, you know, these small commercial farms, 38.6 million acres and 21.6. So they're not, they're not producing nearly as much, you know, off of the land they have, especially even if you go here to the very low sales, uh, you know, just 0.8% uh, of total production, but they operate on 8.6 million acres. See, so there's a lot of potential here in my view to increase what's coming off of these uh, very low sales and small commercial farms in relation to what they're actually uh, producing there. Um, if we look at Arizona here, uh, in terms of the average market sales per farm and total here. So this gives all agricultural products from the, the four census years here of 2017 uh, down through 2002. Uh, you can see it's just under 4 billion here for 2017. Uh, we have about 19,000 farms. So that's why we come up with an average of about $201,000 per farm in terms of market sales. Uh, crops in general, a little bit are higher than, than livestock. Um, you know, part of that, there's some double counting that goes into livestock because like the feed, the alfalfa reproduce, you know, is fed to the alfalfa and then that's added in there. But I guess, I guess the key thing to note here is just that, uh, you know, crops are, are fairly significant as well as livestock in terms of the mix here uh, for Arizona. And we'll try to ad address, address both of those some. In terms of looking at acres operated by farm size, uh, when we look at the, the very low sales, the small commercial, the midsize to the large over time. Uh, we can see since 1992, there's kind of been, a, been an upward trend here in terms of the median acres operated by the large size farms. Uh, the midsize farms have been fairly flat as well as have the, you know, they, they've probably given up a little bit, but, but not too much. And the, the small and uh, small size, Farms here, small commercial, they've declined a little bit here over time. You can see that. Whereas in the very low sales, it's declined just, just a little bit as well on, on the US side. So, you know, some of the trend has been towards you know, some of the larger, larger farms. And, you know, the very low to the small commercial are having a harder time, you know, keeping up, up their value there. When we look at farm size here by Arizona, we can see we have, you know, almost uh, in, the, in the 2017 census here, there's just a little over 9,000 here of our 19,000 farms operate on just that one to nine acre, less than 10 acres. So, you know, fairly, fairly, fairly small acreage there. And then as we increase here to the larger acreages here, then we have, uh, you know, fewer numbers of farms that, that are, are at that level, but we still have, we have more in the 2000 plus acres than we do 1000 to 1900. Um, the average farm size in Arizona is like 1369. You know, that compares with the average farm size here in the US of 441. Uh, the median farm size in the US is 75. And what would be the median farm size here for Arizona? Any guess? I mean, we have half of our farms right over here, right? So that's why we come with the, with the median. We have half below and half above. So, you know, the median farm size in Arizona is not very big. It's only 10 acres. So when you're talking about farm size in Arizona, you really need to be thinking about, is it the average or, or you know, what is, what is the metric if we're thinking of median, you have all these small farms. So it's, it's pretty small um, there. Uh, to break things down just a little bit more, these are some more classes that the Economic Research Service has provided here to look at in terms of farms 
uh, the value of production and the farm assets. So with these small family farms here, that's defined as anything less than 350,000 in gross cash farm income. They're very large, large scale family farms. Uh, that's greater than a million. So it's kind of interesting. There are, I believe, uh, 61,000 uh, large scale family farms here in the US approximately. And how many, I, well, in, the, in this category here, you know, they're all like 92% are considered, you know, family and very few are in this, this non-family uh, category. So uh, when you think of agriculture, whether it's small or large in the US and Arizona, you have to think of, you know, family ownership because that is, is what it is. But the other thing to think of is that we have a lot of farms here in the retirement and off where the off farm occupation is, or their primary occupation is something other than farming, that's over half of, of the farms here that we have here in the US. And there's quite a few that are in this uh, low sales here as well, that don't really have a whole lot in terms of the value of their production, but they do have, you know, 20.1% of the farm assets here in farming. So you know, I think that's opportunity area for, you know, what's going on, you know, this population has the potential to actually produce more for the land that they're on than, you know, probably in this, in this large category up here where you get in, into the large scale farms. And just to show it, the importance of off farm income, uh, this here graph shows, uh, from 1990 to 2018, farm income here that's made up of the yellow there, which is off farm income, and then the green here being uh, farm earnings of farm households. So a couple things to note here on this graph. One, you know, on average, off farm income is huge for farming because we have an awful lot of these small farms here. You know, anything with kind of sales less than 350,000 could kind of fit into that category. Uh, the other thing to note, I think on this graph here is what do we see over time? You go back here in the 90s, 1994, uh, farm income was at or a little below the income of all US households, right? But as you see over time here, it's a switch to where, uh, you know, farm income, especially, you know, not even just farm income after the farm earnings, but off farm income has been above that of, on average, of the average household income across the US. So. I guess it's something to keep in mind when you think of some of the policies and whatnot in particular. And just to, to give a little, this is another breakdown here that Economic Research Service does in terms of looking at, at the, the total income side here by some of these farm sizes. And you see here with uh, total income on the commercial farm side up here, we're basically, you know, the median income here, you know, above $190,000. But what, what is that income made up from? Okay, the blue here gives income from off-farm sources. That off-farm income here is divided into what we call unearned income, which could be dividends, rents, or whatnot, as well as earned, earned income, which could, could be a, an off-farm job. That could be, you know, a spouse working in town or the owner doing, uh, you know, sprinkler sales or something, you know, something else on the side. So you can see that uh, off-farm income, it, it's not as crucial for commercial farms as like say these intermediate or the rural residential farms, but it's still, you know, pr pretty significant. Um, income from farming here, for those that are greater than 350,000 in, in gross cash farm income is about 140,000. So this here makes up basically most of the total income here for the commercial farms. 
the intermediate farms here under this definition are less than 350,000 with the gross cash farm income and their main occupation is farming. So whereas the rural residence farms, their main occupation is not farming. They're primarily, and that shows up here in terms of uh, where we have our total income here. You can see that off, income from off farm sources is, is fairly high and there's actually a little loss here associated with income from farming. And earned income is, is very high because they have an occupation that's not in farming. Contrast that with intermediate farms where they're, in terms of by definition, they're the same as under 350,000, but their main occupation is farming here. You can see that, you know, the off farm or the earned income here is, is really uh, quite, quite a bit lower than it is here on the rural residence farms. So these are just uh, things to keep in mind, I think, uh, when you think of what it takes to run a small farm and where the income is coming from. Uh, also, when you think of it in terms of getting into it, in terms of the farm balance sheet, you know, this is, this is rather enlightening because this gives you an idea, you know, what it takes to, what are the assets behind this total income over here for the commercial farm, this total income over here on, on the farm income in particular here, this, this, the income from farming over here, you see it's negative. What kind of farm assets are behind that? Okay, on the balance sheet, you can see this is the total household assets and the farm assets here. Uh, you're looking at basically about 3 million in terms of farm assets for these commercial farms that are greater than 350,000 in gross cash farm income. Uh, they do have household debt and some of it is in farm debt. When you get to the intermediate farms and the rural residence farms, they basically have no debt, as you can see that. The farm debt or non-farm debt is really non-existent and it's a good thing, right? Probably they have no farm debt because they, they have no cash income here off the farm to really generate a, a loan. I mean, if you're going in for a loan, what are you gonna need? You're gonna need a positive cash flow to pay back that loan. And if on average, you know, you're down to next to zero on your, your farm income, that's not going to generate anything for a farm debt or for, for a loan on that, up, that front. Uh, when you look at household assets, they're total, they're about the same here, except the intermediate farms, more of it's made of farm assets than it is here for the rural residents, which is what you'd expect. Uh, and they have higher non-farm assets than the intermediate farms because you know their main occupation is not farming. So they probably have uh, assets in related relation to their job in, in, in particular, even could be in their retirement account. So when we think of these categories here, it, part of it is to think about, you know, where's the opportunities for growth and then where is the vulnerabilities? And if you look at it in terms of, as, as they did in, in this analysis here with ERS and looking at you know, the difference between 2007 and 2012 census of agriculture, they found that you know, of the small commercial farms here, 19% grew by more than 50% uh, in, in terms of their, their gross cash farm income from 2007 to 2012, but 34% decreased by more than 50%. So no matter how you look at this data here, it would say that the small commercial are the most vulnerable in terms of their farming activities, as opposed to the larger operations. Although you can see, you know, 23% uh, decreased by more than 50% with the large, uh, that's that's pretty significant as well, but for the most part, you had about two thirds that were just kind of within, uh, you know, the plus or minus that fifty percent range. Whereas with the small commercial, we're down to forty-seven percent. So, you know, I guess that's one reason why maybe there's the focus here on the small commercial farms because you know they look to be the most vulnerable as well as maybe even having some of the most opportunity uh, for some of the growth that they have there, and. This is a, a, 
a chart here, pie chart here from Economic Research Service, just to show that what the farm value is as a percent of retail sales uh, for different commodities. So the whole milk that you might actually drink, uh, you know, on a daily basis, you think, well, that's you know directly from the dairy. Well, about 50% of that value is the farm value, and the rest is retail sales. You know, something like iceberg lettuce, where we think of over in Yuma, there's a lot of lettuce sold up, up the farm there. Once it leaves the farm, that's only basically 21% of the retail value there. They have transportation that often doubles it, plus they have a lot of re what they call retail shrink when it goes to the, to the grocery store uh, in the sense that not all of it's gonna get sold. So in, in total, you know, 21% for iceberg lettuce, uh, fresh oranges, you think of, well, you know, you pick an orange off of the orange tree, that's pretty much ready for the, for the consumer market, but only 15% of that value there of a fresh orange actually goes back to the farm value. So one of the ways some of the small farms have tried to, you know, see about getting into this is more direct farm marketing to capture some of this value. And that's, that's one of the things that, that, that we'll look at here. And also what's interesting, you think about there's interest, you know, pretty high right now in terms of small scale beef processing. And why is that? So this shows going from uh, 2010 here up to 2020, what the net farm value has been for beef. This is like uh, choice beef yield grade three. And then the, the orange up here uh, shows what the retail value is. So what do we see here that happened here? And in, in basically here, if we come down, it was in June, it May, June and July, we had really high consumer prices here. Okay, with where well, we had COVID going on, right? Because the packing plants were going pretty good, then they started to get infections and we're having a hard time keeping up. Okay, so what happened then? At the same time, uh, the farm values started to go down in part because well, they didn't have processing capacity, so they were going down. So what did that do? That pulled down the farm share as a percent of retail to the lowest point it is in this whole graph. And I think probably almost, almost a, a record low here of just around you know, 32%. So I guess, you know, part of it, if you're thinking of getting into the business, uh, do you want to base it on this 32% or would you think of it, you know, maybe somewhere over in here, 45% uh, or something? Well, you know, I mean, I guess if COVID is really on people's mind coming again, you know, maybe it's going to be in this lower range, but you can see it's probably going to move back up here over time, I would guess, if we don't have any you know, restrictions with regards to packing plants in, in particular, and, you know, COVID becomes under, under control. But you can see this is one of the reasons why, you know, direct marketing is looked after. Um, here's an example a display at a farmer's market. Um, just to look at kind of the operations over time here, uh, this is the Ag Census data. So, there's about almost a thousand operations here in Arizona with direct farm market sales. You know, so that's only 5% of all farms, but uh, there are a fair number. Uh, you know, Maricopa has the most 164 farms and then 148 in Yavapai County. Uh, what's interesting to me is if we look at what is the percent of these direct sales over total sales by the county there. You can see Yavapai is by far the largest, uh, you know, almost at 10% there. Uh, then you have to go down to where you get into Cochise at like 1.8%. And then you're looking at, uh, you know, down in the Nogales area, uh, Santa Cruz County, 1.7%. And then you're like at Maricopa, 1.3%, and up at Coconino County, 1.3%. So, uh, you know, just in terms of the relative importance there, of direct sales uh, versus total sales, uh, clearly Yavapai uh, jumps out there. If we look at it over by the US, uh, average direct sales uh, to consumer uh, by county. Uh, the, this here gives, 
you know, some of the range in terms of the operations here. So this, this shows here that Maricopa and, uh, and Yuma are the larger here for Arizona and Yavapai and Cochise kind of follow. Um, if we look at it on per capita basis, uh, you can see that uh, Yavapai and Cochise are the largest in terms of their uh, direct market sales. And then if we look at uh, on per capita and the change in operations, uh, so uh, Cochise actually has the largest at $20.59 per person in terms of direct sales. I'm sure a lot of that has to do with people from Tucson going to places like, you know, Apple Annie's, uh, you know, those direct sales get counted, but, you know, even though th th those people are doing day trips from Tucson, that probably inflates that. Uh, Yavapai County, you know, Prescott, we probably have some people from Phoenix going up there on the weekends, maybe inflating that a bit. But, you know, it just shows that even though they're a rural county, they can still have pretty large in terms of sales per person in the rural areas. Uh, Yuma, uh, 5.17. And this here gives the change in the number of operations. You can see we had a big drop here in Maricopa and in Yuma counties. Uh, the increase was strictly just in Yavapai and uh, uh, Gila County. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's Gila, right? Yeah, Gila, um, when we go from 2012 to 2017. Um, and this is shows it on the US side in terms of the, the change in the direct farm operations uh, per county. Uh, that shows uh, over here, you can see the, the Yavapai County in particular, but you can see we had several counties here that had quite a drop in terms of the number of direct farm marketing operations between 2012 and 2017. Um, in terms of direct sales on average, though they increased quite a bit here in Maricopa and Yuma, as well as in, uh, Yavapai and Cochise. And I think part of it was we had a big drop in some of the operations there that were on the lower end. So that caused a large increase in terms of the average amount of sales going. Plus there's more value added apparently being counted now as well. Uh, so, you know, 102,000 average in terms of the direct marketing sales per operation in Maricopa County, pretty significant. Uh, 23,588 for Yavapai County. Um, and they, you know, but they did have a large increase from, from the census there as well. And, uh, you know, Yuma as well jumped up there uh, quite a bit here from 2012 to 2017, you know. And so there is the potential out there uh, for direct farm marketing sales. And one of the things that we've been working on here at the university is this website called localfresh.info. Um, this is a screenshot of what it looks like. So if I just put in carrots here and then click on this search here, um, that would take me over and show me some of the carrots here available. Uh, if I pull down the area, if I can have, have it you know, automatically look for me where I'm at or pull down one of these regions here. I just pulled down the Prescott Yavapai area. Uh, this gives kind of the standard carrots that are here and the farms in the area. Uh, if I click here on Whipstone Farm, it gives me, you know, their calendar and whatnot. But one of the things we found that was really difficult was to enter all of this information here takes a lot of grower time. And as we just even see here today, uh, grower time is, is pretty valuable. You know, they don't, want to do something twice. So what we're working at is uh, with the, the cyber and communications uh, CCC technology team, uh, seeing how we can import their data using like a point of sale software system. I know uh, there are some uh, direct marketers using like Square. So the idea is we would utilize that information to populate uh, a system like local fresh so that the consumers can see what is available. Uh, some people on the CC team that have worked on this are uh, Craig, Han, and Toby, but also Matt here has taken the lead here to look at, uh, you know, a database system here for like integrating in particular Square 
data uh, into like local fresh. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt and he can uh, give you a little bit about what's going on there. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, I'm Matt Harmon <clears throat> and as Russ said, I'm with the uh, CCT group at, uh, at the College of Ag and Life Sciences. And um, as he identified, one of the things that we've seen is that entering this information for the harvest calendar uh, can be a little bit of a, a little tedious, uh, it maybe takes a little bit of time. And uh, we've come to understand that there are several folks out there who are using Square. So I don't know if you use it or not. If, if you're not uh, familiar with it, this is uh, what uh, Square calls its item library or its, its catalog. Uh, and then one of the other things you can do with it is it'll track your transactions. So when you've uh, sold a particular item on a particular date, it, it'll keep hold of that. So as it turns out, uh, there's a way to integrate um, or Square offers a means of integrating that data, that sales data uh, to other, other uh, applications or other websites. And so we've been working on uh, for the past little while on a way of directly pulling that sales data, that transaction data into local fresh so that it will automatically populate the harvest calendar. So I'll briefly walk you through what we've got so far. We're getting very close to being able to release this on a, um, a sort of a pre-release or, or what, what, what we would in the IT business call a beta or, or a test. Um, capability for folks who are very interested in it and we'll work with them to to get it to work um, but so the way this works is um, there's a there's a panel here that you can go through you can get any one of these steps individually so if you update locations uh, or you update your catalog or, or your transactions you can pull that in at any time but if you're just starting out you want to bring in your different locations within square um, in this case, I've, I've set up a couple of test locations. Once we do that, it actually then pulls your item catalog from Square. And here within Local Fresh, uh, we can select, we can we do the matching, right? So the Square item is here in this column. Uh, and then a Local Fresh item is, is here. And I'm using test data here. So it looks a little funny. That's just my setup. Um, so then once we've matched up the square items with the local fresh items, uh, we have a means here of um, then actually building the harvest calendar. Um, so and I, again, I apologize for the appearance on this a little bit. It might look a little little wonky. We're, we're still in, we're still developing it, but, but we're almost there. Um, and so this is what's been pulled back from that transaction on my on my test setup. So it gives you a final option here to uh, update your availability on these items based on transactions that have occurred. And initially we're setting this over the last 24 months or two years. Um, and then once once you do that, you you click on um, import that data and uh, It'll go through here. This may take a few seconds because my system's a little slow, um, but it will automatically fill in that that calendar information on uh, your in your catalog. So to give you an idea of, let's see here. Let's see if I can. Well, we'll just bring that up very quick. Uh, bring up some items, All right? So. If you go in and uh, we look at that that data, we can see that we've actually, and once it comes up, and forgive my uh, forgive the delay here, you can actually see um, that that information has been added. And I've added several others here, but these were the these were some of the dates that that we had pulled in directly from Square. Um, so that's a that's a brief outline of that process. And, uh, and how that works. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it back to, I can, I'll bring it back to Russ now, uh, if I can. Yeah, so I'm, Isaac, do you have anything or do you wanna go to uh, Riley now or then questions or 
Does anybody have questions now or? Yeah, I think we'll take some few questions if there is any uh, before we go to, since the topics are a little bit uh, different. So if you have any question, uh, you can ask Russ or Max now for some, especially in the app, it's very fascinating. That should be very useful to the viewers, right? So anybody, doesn't mean that anybody can use the app to know where products are being produced so they can easily locate it with the map? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you just have to add, add an account and then put your, a lot of people don't want their exact location known though. So, I mean, that's also in there as well, but it'd be the general area, but not, you know, uh, the specific uh, crossroads, yeah. Perfect. And so Isaac, I'm actually gonna ask you to take over the screen sharing. I'm sorry, my computer has, has um, created a bit of a mess here where I can't, I can't stop sharing my screen, so. Yeah, I think it should be good now, right? Um, unfortunately, I can't. I can't tell. Um, I can. I can still communicate, but I can't tell what the status of the of screen share on my screen sharing is. So, can good. anyone confirm the screen share? Um, yeah, no, it looks fine. And and just to answer in the chat, yeah, local fresh is a, is a, a U of A effort. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. Um, do we have some more questions coming? Okay, now, uh, Rylan, are you here? Uh, maybe you can take over now to give us an overview of your aquaponic project that you've been working on. Um, yeah, um, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, yeah, sorry about being a little bit late, but um, thanks for the patience and I enjoyed the last presentation. So um, yeah, Isaac, are you okay with just switching the slides when I give you a heads up? Yeah, that's, that's good. Okay. All right. So yeah, I'm just going to talk about uh, a grant that we got that's part of the, the Western SARE, the Sustainable Agriculture uh, Research and Education Grant. And we're, we've partnered with USGS um, and we're looking at um, basically looking at creating new uh, space efficient growing techniques, focusing on water conservation, um, native fish preservation, and increased crop yields for small farmers. Um, so next. And um, yeah, so a little, this is just a little bit about our farm. Um, so I'm Rylan, by the way, <laughs> um, with Forestdale Farm. We're a small uh, farm in Flagstaff, Arizona. We have, um, Two different properties. One we're kind of developing um, that's a little bigger, but the most of our production is on a small three-quarter acre um, area where we do a lot of leafy greens. We do a lot of root vegetables, um, but the main and we have we grow a variety of everything. But the main thing we focus on is kind of salad type greens and baby greens. Um, so we, as a farm, we do a lot of rainwater catchment. Our farm has 50,000 gallons of water storage, which includes a pond. Um, so we collect a lot of rainwater and we use rainwater to irrigate. So we're really cautious about how much water we use and um, kind of our input. So that's kind of the, where this grant stemmed from is kind of developing ways we can be more water conscious in growing. Um, and yeah, that's so the project overview is basically um, and these are all the pictures in here are from our farm and from the project just for reference. But um, we're basically looking, the main one thing is space efficiency. So a lot of the growers in our region in Northern Arizona and especially around Flagstaff, um, what, you know, land is expensive. It's not always very accessible. So um, it's really important for people to utilize the space they have really efficiently um, to make it work in, the, in this kind of area. And it also applies for other urban urban kind of uh, areas and farms. So um, this picture here, you can see, this is the experiment on the right. Um, and there's all of the, all of the plants are kind of on a tiered grow tables. And underneath that is where the fish tanks are. And there'll be more, I'll talk more about that um, in some future slides, but, um, and then, yeah. So to kind of go back over that, 
the main reason is to benefit um, growers in our um, in our neck of the woods. So this research grant had a lot of educational components where we would try to get growers out, show them the systems. Um, we'd put out a little video um, about kind of the whole setup, walking people through it. Um, and again, um, again, that's just kind of like the, the emphasis is basically how do you yield the most in a small amount of space? So this is an intensive production system that has a lot of frequent planting and a lot of rotation stacking. Um, and the experiment all was done kind of in a high tunnel just for reference. So it's a 70 foot by 26 foot uh, wide high tunnel. So it's all kind of a little more controlled, but you know, it is farming, so it's hard to control everything. Um, so yeah, next. Um, so the experiment design, um, this picture kind of shows you the outline of what we did. So on the, in the background, you can see that again, the tiered tables with the fish tanks underneath it. Um, we looked at um, six kind of independent, each, we had six independent systems for that. So uh, we had a, a, a grow tank, a fish tank essentially on the bottom, which was about 200 gallons. And then we had two tiers of tables on top of them. And we had that replicated six times across the length of the greenhouse. Um, in three of the treatments, we had fish. In um, three of the treatments, we didn't have fish. Um, and all of those were set up as an artificial stream um, type system. So we had you know, water circulating through it, a filter, uh, air stone, and everything to kind of mimic a natural um, stream process. Um, and then on the other side, you can see the in-ground growing um, treatments. So those were more just kind of like to have a comparison to our normal farm yield. So that's typically how we grow. We grow really dense greens um, where we're covering every bit of space um, and it's all on drip irrigation. And then we, you know, so it's pretty intensive for, but it's all in ground growing. So um, that kind of served as a reference point. So how much yield do we get, you know, in our normal growing techniques, we can compare it to this the aquaponics with the fish in it. And then we also have the, the treatments without fish to sort of set a real baseline um, too. So we can kind of compare those three different um, yields essentially to look at what's the most effective and also what uses the least amount of water. Um, here's another kind of close up on the tank systems. I'll talk about them a little bit more here, but um, so yeah, this is just a, a biological filter that we had set up. So in these um, filters, there's a whole bunch of tiny beads and they basically, it's kind of like if you think about a stream, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, but um, if you think about a stream, you have the gravel um, substrate in the stream. So in this case, we're kind of mimicking that by having a whole bunch of little beads in these filter that provide a lot of surface area. And in a stream, you'd have bacteria colonizing the, um, the gravel. In this case, you have the bacteria colonizing inside the filter. And um, that is really critical for uh, fish production because, you know, like um, as a fish excretes its ammonia, which can be toxic to fish. Um, and also um, the biological activity in the filter will basically break that down into nitrite and then nitrate. Um, and nitrate is something um, essentially nitrogen, which plants can take up, you know, so, so by having the biological filter, you can have really high densities of fish in, um, in these tiny tanks, you know, so they're about 200 gallon tanks. And we were had about 600 juvenile uh, uh, fish, which I'll get more into in each tank. Um, but so the filter was really critical to keep the water quality. Um, also for aeration, fish need oxygen in the water as well. Um, we had backup oxygen diffusers in case um, something tripped or we lost power. Um, we could still have oxygen. We wouldn't lose all the fish in the in the experiment. Um, and this, the table in this, you can see it is just you know a basic a plastic kind of table that we used as a as the grow tables. And there was a valve um, connected to each filter, so we could bypass the filter when we needed a water. So every every tank was basically its own system. You know, it, it would filter and then when we would water the plants on that, um, on the, the grow tables, we would be using the water directly from each tank in, as separate, so. 
All right, and then this is another, this is kind of a look at it more in the middle of the experiment when things were going pretty, growing pretty fast. Um, so uh, we kind of standardized everything for the, for the experiment. So we had a potting mix, we mix our own potting mix. Um, and it was a basically a pretty low nutrient potting mix. We added a little bit of fertilizer to it just to give plants a start. Um, but it was basically real minimal. Um, and then we would standardize all the seeding and all the pots. Um, and we would plant kind of every week until everything was in full production. And then as we harvested, we would replant. So we continued to have the space, you know, under as high production as we could for the, the space that it was in. Um, the, the grow tables you can see here where there's a little bit of space underneath them. So if we were germinating new plants, we could put them under there. Um, and the basic plan or the basic setup design was basically to harvest everything at maturity or when it was at its best for market. Um, so, and we also looked at the difference between six inch pots and four inch pots to kind of get an idea. Um, can you yield more with a bigger pot um, versus a smaller pot? And does, how does that affect, you know, your potting mix usage and everything? So again, we're really trying to find the most beneficial way to grow, you know, with low overhead costs and also maximize yields in this kind of symbiotic system with fish in it. Um, and the other key point, again, is just water conservation. So that was a big, a big uh, part of this experiment was to measure how much each treatment used in water. And again, compare that back to our in-ground growing that we do on the farm to kind of get a, a sense of that. So, um, okay, next. So the native fish side, and this is a lot of uh, thanks to USGS, um, David Ward there, who was a fish expert. So um, we looked at uh, round tail chub, which are uh, an important uh, native fish, fish species in our region. Um, a lot of the fishes in Arizona are threatened because of you know, water use issues and um, you know, the, the dams in the Colorado River and everything too. So a lot of the native fish are really um, not doing that well in our region. So it's important to help, you know, it's important for farmers like us to partner with uh, state and uh, government agencies for these conservation outreaches. It kind of has a double benefit. It benefits us, but it also helps benefit, you know, um, the state as a whole and um, important species. So um, again, I think I mentioned this, but we had about 600 in each tank. So we had three different tanks um, with 600 juvenile chub. You can see in these pictures about the size. So they're pretty small fish. Um, and we would monitor the water quality. Um, the picture here is putting in a pit tag, which is just a responder tag that you can scan. So it gives each figure, each fish that we're measuring growth on their own number essentially that we can tie back to. So at the beginning of the experiment, we can measure the length going in. And then at the end of the ex experiment, we can measure how much the fish grew. So that kind of gives us an idea, like are we able to get decent growth on these fish? Um, to make it um, useful. And the idea behind um, the fish is, uh, so USGS does a lot of, David Ward has a laboratory where he does a lot of um, research and competition experiments looking at native fish versus non-native fish. So he needs a lot of specimens. So by it, for us to kind of help rear up specimens to the right length that he needs for experiments helps with conservation practices and also if the fish get to a big enough um, size, they could be released, you know, as, as game and fish and hatchery, um, you know, would stock these species in the wild anyways. Um, so yeah, next. Um, this is just another uh, little slide about the in-ground growing treatments. Um, so, uh, we standardized this too, to just kind of get an idea of how much seed each different treatment uses, you know, versus um, the grow tables versus the in-ground. So we standardized the seeding. Um, we basically tried to control as much as we could, but, you know, we had to add compost for fertilization, which is a little different than the potting mix. Um, and the same thing, we would harvest when things were mature and ready for market, and we would look at the, the water usage. Next. 
So here's some of the results of the grow tables. Um, so, you know, to clarify again, we had three tanks with fish and three tanks without fish. And we're watering all the plants above the tanks um, with water from the tanks. So um, this is kind of the visual. We haven't ran a lot of the numbers. We just finished up the experiment recently. So I threw in some stuff that I just kind of um, put together, but we haven't, we don't have a lot of graphs or anything right now. So it's going to be a lot of visual pictures right here, but um, which tell the, tell a great story. So this is a picture of kale. So we looked at three different crops. We did kale, arugula, and salad. And um, those are our really popular um, crops for us to grow. Um, so we want to, you know, find a way to maximize production on those. And we typically grow them as baby greens or salad mix type greens. So this is a, a direct comparison of kale that was planted. Again, same time, same potting mix. The only difference is being watered from, uh, you know, the one on the left, the bigger one is from fish, the fish waste tanks. And the one on the right is just from the standard um, growing tables with the water underneath it. So um, you can kind of see, we're trying to break it down into square footage. Um, because again, we're looking at everything based on a square footage. So how much pounds of one crop can we yield per square foot? And what's the most effective way to do that? So um, this kind of shows you on the right, um, our in-ground treatment, we had about 0.24 pounds of kale per square foot. Um, and then the, the four inch control, that's again, the pots that are pictured, the four inch pots, we had about 0.13. So that's significantly lower, which is expected. Um, but then the interesting thing is the four inch pots with fish have a higher yield than the in-ground even. So, you know, and every little bit of a yield makes quite a big, big difference, especially when you grow, you know, expand the operation and are growing a lot more. So um, in this case, you can see that the six inch pots, which are the more round, bigger pots, in the treatments with fish had the highest yield and the next was the four inch pots followed by the in-ground. So that's kind of a good story. And it shows that, you know, by adding fish to the system, um, if you're doing just container growing, you're almost doubling your production. But even if you're doing um, really fertile, like our, our soil in that greenhouse is really fertile. We had a lot of compost, really good production that we've dialed in over the years. And even under that, um, this new system with fish has a higher yield. So it's really just right off the bat, it's really promising to show, you know, like by adding the fish, you minimize your fertilizer and all of that, but you're also actually really seeing a yield compared to in-ground growing. Um, next. And this is the same thing. It's again, really clear. This is the salad mix um, yields. So, you know, on the left, you got pretty much a full size salad head ready for harvest. Um, on the right, you know, thing it's not even wasn't even really worth harvesting or marketing at that point. Um, and these again were planted the same exact time, treated exactly the same in the same greenhouse. Um, and the only difference was the addition of fish to the system. Um, so, so the visual kind of tells a story there too. But um, comparing it to in ground again, um, you know, which. So our in-ground treatments, 0.47 pounds per square foot. Um, and our, you know, the, the, if you just look at the six inch fish, um, it's 0.53. So again, an increased yield in that. And the real benefit too about having the grow the, um, the tiered tables is you can really rotate things in and out fast. You can stack them, you can move things around um, and you can kind of harvest what's ready and you can kind of move things that aren't ready. So it's kind of has a benefit um, just for space efficiency, being able to move all the pots and kind of utilize the space, you know, for effectively and have the, the ones that are harvested out of the system and planting right away for the new ones. Whereas in the ground, you kind of have to wait till everything is ready. And uh, sometimes you can't even, you don't want to harvest the whole bed because you can't market it. So you're cutting a piece of the bed and then you're having to wait, you know, until you harvest the rest of the bed to replant. So it, it makes it a little difficult for high production. Um, and then arugula again, arugula was actually the hardest thing um, that we found to grow in pots. The yields weren't 
that great. Um, so I think in general, Rugla actually does better in ground um, for the way we've been doing it. But um, again, the treatments without fish, the arugula just suffered and was not even really harvestable. And a lot of that is just the nutrients of it, which makes sense. Um, but we wanted to have that controlled so we could see the difference between fish and non-fish. And the main thing here is, yeah, um, the in-ground actually yielded a little higher and um, the production in ground of arugula did seem to be better. And again, a lot of that is we're planting really densely and arugula in the pots just didn't seem to do as well at the densing or at the seeding ratio that we typically use. Um, and then, so water usage, this is kind of a, we're still playing with this quite a bit. So we don't have a lot of numbers on this, but um, this is just kind of a quick average in the middle of the season. So June to August um, in gallons, again, broken down to square foot. So we can kind of see, you know, how much water is being used per square foot. Um, in ground, we had a little bit, um, they all were actually really similar, which is interesting. Um, but a part of that problem was um, that we had a few kind of mishaps with water, you know, like the meter, had a problem at one point and we had um, a tank that lost some water at one point. So there was kind of hard, we're trying to like tease out all of that to get a good picture of the water usage. But it does seem like that they are pretty similar, which kind of surprises me. But a lot of that is because of, um, in our aquaponic treatments, we're doing it all in pots. So sometimes in aquaponics, you can have you can use a grow medium or you can have it as part of the system where things are floating on the water. And I've done that in the past and I've just had really bad um, yields and a lot of maintenance issues. So when we did it with pots, um, it's really straightforward, you know, everything's just hand watered, but it does seem to use a little bit more water. So, um, so as we kind of figure that out, we'll get more numbers, but it does seem they're all pretty similar. Um, but the other thing is when we break it down to harvest, um, you know, water use, and when we throw the harvest in there, that's, I think, where we'll see the difference. So, you know, for example, if we wanted five pounds of kale um, in, in ground, we would probably, we would be using a lot more water to grow that five pounds than in the, um, on the grow tables. So that's kind of where the interesting story will come in, but we haven't um, been able to play with those numbers yet. Um, so, yeah, again, the main pro point of this uh, project, it was funded by SARE. So it's the, it's a research and education grant. So, you know, we really want it to be able to benefit um, farming and sustainable farming in particular. So the benefit of this kind of research that we've, that we're putting together is just increased diversification and productivity for small farms. So you have, you know, instead of just having one thing, essentially a bed of kale, you're throwing in um, another aspect to that. So you have fish production and this can be, you know, native fish production, which we did, or it can even just be a food crop. You know, you could grow catfish or you could grow um, tilapia or anything like that. So it basically increases the productivity of the farm because you're getting a whole nother commodity or another yield or another, in our case, just another conservation strong point for the farm. Um, and then the water conservation, um, or we could, yeah, water conservation. Um, again, the water is recirculated in the systems and reused. So theoretically per yield, again, I don't have the results right now, but the, since a lot of the water, you know, we're watering the plants above the table. So any excess water is going back into the, into the water tanks. Um, whereas in the ground, all your excess water is running off. Um, and that also ties into, you know, just runoff issues for bigger farms too. If you're irrigating, you're losing nutrients in your soil, they're getting runoff. But in the aquaponic systems, basically everything is staying in, in the system. It's kind of, it's a closed loop system. So um, you're watering the plants from above, excess water and nutrients will go back into the water, back through the filtration um, and, you know, can be reused. Um, and then the fish waste, Again, you know, you save on fertilizer, you save on compost addition. Um, you're, the only nutrients that the leafy greens got was the fish waste. So, you know, just by having that source, um, which is um, 
exactly what they need at that stage, you know, a lot of nitrogen. So it's a really great fertilizer um, and it reduces kind of farm inputs. Um, and yeah, that's it. Um, you know, I wanna thank the Western Sayer grants, which has been a great, um, really easy to work with and a really great grant for the farm. It's been really fun. Um, and it's kind of expanded a lot of our um, knowledge and it allowed us to share a lot of what we're doing with the community. So we're really excited about this grant um, and we're wrapping it up and continuing to put things together with it, so. Uh, yeah, at that, I guess I'll pass it off or answer any questions if there's any. Very exciting, right? Very, very exciting. Uh, thank let's take, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and to share this project with us. We really appreciate it. And um, I'm sure most of the growers here will really appreciate that um, this is very informative. Now open the floor for any few questions that we may have for Rylan. Uh, Rylan, I have a, a beginning question. Now, in terms of the cost, do you think that the initial cost will be worth it to invest into this sort of aquaponic systems? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, it is again, like a little, upfront cost, but there's a lot of stuff you can repurpose and reuse, um, which farmers are great at doing anyway. So this, the, the grant was really nice because we were able to, you know, get some nice filters and things like that, but you can actually build your own filters, um, fish tanks, even our, even the tanks we used in this were repurposed tanks. So they were actually tanks from government surplus that were used to ship various things. And we, basically transformed them into fish tanks. So, um, you know, I think the overhead cost can be pretty minimal, especially if you're utilizing materials that you have or around. Um, you can build your own gravel filter just out of like pea gravel even, um, and just circulate water through that. Um, and then again, I think it's kind of looking at the yield, you know, like how much more yield are you gonna get? How much are you gonna save on fertilizer, which is a big thing, or compost additions. Um, and that's kind of where it might start to make sense for small farmers. If they're like, well, I don't have to add compost to my beds every year, or if they have trouble sourcing compost or um, organic fertilizers can be kind of expensive. If they have, you know, if that's a big cost issue for them, it might make sense to kind of invest a little bit more in the infrastructure and also, you know, and this is all not even factoring in any yield you would get from a edible fish species. You know, like if you were using a catfish and you were able to sell that as a crop, um, you know, that's extra income for the farm. So in my mm -hmm. mind, it makes a lot of sense. Um, it is a bit of a learning curve and it can be troublesome, but you know, in the long term, I think it's a good, a good business model. Oh, okay, that's awesome. I think there was something in the chat that what kind of soil mix did you use? Yeah, so, so we do a lot of um, potting on the farm anyways. We do a lot of greenhouse production and things like that too. So we actually, I source bulk coconut core, which ties into your background actually, <laughs> right there, the little palm tree. Um, so coconut core is kind of more, a more sustainable um, potting mix than peat moss, which is typically what, you know, a lot of people use as peat moss. So we buy coconut corn bulk and then we mix it basically with the same, the normal stuff, perlite, vermiculite, and then we add a little bit of uh, organic fertilizer to it. Mm, okay. So this was kind of like your own uh, uh, mix, not something you bought completely from the market. Yeah, it's one we've used and kind of standardized over the years and we've got a pretty good ratio of it. So we so it, yeah, it's basically like 70% coconut core and then the rest is vermiculite, perlite and, and fertilizer. Any more questions? I have one more question for Roland. If there is none, I can go ahead and ask it. One in the chat some... box. Oh, okay. Ross. There's a question in the chat box. For... Okay, let me see. Where's the chat box? I can't see my chat. Uh, where is it? Uh, can someone see the chat and quickly read it to us? 
Yes, well, I, maybe Drew can ask it as well, but he's asking, he says the kale results and the pounds per square foot in the ground versus the high tunnel, were these grown at the same time of the year? And during the experiment, did you grow during the colder months using the high tunnel to extend growing season? Okay, so, okay, yeah, so the kale, so everything was grown, basically our grant started, you know, it basically was the main growing season for us here, which is, um, we started in, let's see. So the experiment started like in May and basically it just ended at the end of uh, October. So um, this is all, yeah, and everything was basically to kind of look at the amount of, and it's all in the high tunnel. So it's all um, similar spacing in the high tunnel, like orientation and everything's the same. We did about three foot wide beds, um, you know, the full length of the high tunnel, so 65 feet. So we tried to standardize as much as we could, um, but there is some differences, um, you know, with things being planted. We recorded everything, but like the kale in ground, for instance, most of the, the whole bed would be planted at once just because that's efficient for our farm. I and mean, we couldn't really lose that yield over the season. So we'd plant the whole bed, standardize that, but as in the grow tables, they would be staggered a little bit more and they would be planted kind of more frequently because we were harvesting more frequently. In the ground, we would harvest the whole bed at once and then replant it. Um, does that, did that answer the question? So basically, it all was in the same growing season, but it wasn't, you know, per, per se, like the same exact month. And we didn't do any, uh, the grant didn't extend into the early, early season or the late season. So it was pretty much the core season. Yeah, so what I said, uh, the, the question is answered the way, uh, that's what they were asking now. Okay, in terms of, uh, the water usage, do you think that we should be more particular about how much water is being saved or for the fact that we're able to do two things with the same water that would have been for one thing is enough to, to be say, okay, we can grow our fish in the water and use the water to water our crops, which is already an added benefit. Should we be more concerned about whether we are saving water at this point or we should just be more focused on the fact that we're able to do two things with one. Yeah, no, that's a great point actually. Um, and that's kind of the key about the system. You know, the more, the more things you have tied into one system that are benefiting each other, the better, right? So, I mean, yeah, if you just, um, you know, that's a good point to look at because the water is being utilized for two things, right? It's for watering the plants and getting the nutrients transferred to the plants, but it's also growing the fish. So that's a very valid point. And I don't know how you would tie that into like the, a number, but that is a good point because you are getting an extra benefit out of the treatments with fish. And that's hard to tie in and see in the numbers. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. All right, any more questions? Uh, Ryan, thank you so much for making time to talk to us. Uh, are there any more questions? If they are not, um, we'll end it here. All right, so I'm going to share, uh, launch the poll for just some few responses as possible. So just respond to this poll and let's see um, if there are some things that we need to do better or if there are some changes in terms of knowledge gain. Well, thank you for putting on the information. It was very interesting. Thank you too for attending.